it's time Good morning, guys. Good morning. Okay, the psalmist David said it was good to be in the house of the Lord. And uh, we are here today, we are gathered here today to lift up his name, to give him honor and glory for who he is and for all that he has done for us. As we go to prayer today, um, we always like to pray for a different ministry in the area. And, uh, and today, let's pray for um, Live Oak, a Christian church right next to Walmart. And uh, let's pray for them and for their ministry and uh, their efforts in reaching others for Jesus Christ. We always like to pray for our church family, for everyone who is here today. And uh, you may have come to church this morning with uh, various needs. Or something heavy on your heart let's bring that before the Lord today as we go to prayer so let's pray and uh, if God has laid upon your heart someone a family I encourage you to take a moment to to lift that person to you that that neighbor next to you across the street the person that you play golf with or you met at the swimming pool, or anyone for that matter that you may have come in contact with. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for your goodness and your mercies towards us. We thank you for what you have done for us in the past and what you promised to do for us in the future. We give you praise and and honor and glory for everything. We thank you for our church family today, for everyone who is here today, for those who could not be here for one reason or another. We lift them all before you and thank you, O oh God, that you will touch each and every one of us in a special way. You know the very needs that are being represented here just now. And we lift all of those before you. And we speak favor in the name of Jesus on behalf of everyone here. We thank you and we praise you. We pray for the ministry of Live Oak Christian Church that you would watch over them today and their efforts in reaching others for Jesus. We thank you, God, that we are not the only one trying to, to reach others, but there are so many different churches and organizations we pray for them but watch over them today we pray we thank you and we praise you I pray for Pastor Don as he would come and share the word that you would give him the wisdom and the knowledge that he needs today the words that will be imparted to us would be a blessing be with our worship team watch over them as they warm our hearts in music and song, challenges lift our spirits up. We thank you. And as we are being faithful stewards to you today, in our tithes and in our offering, bless it all to your name's honor and glory. And all of this we ask in Jesus' name. And all of God's people say, Amen. Stand with us this morning. Any die 
that he rose Those giants are dead now This is our God This is who he is He loves us This is our God This is what he does He saves us He bore the cross Beat the grave Let heaven and earth proclaim This is our God That we could barely pray, but he heard every word, every whisper. And now those altars in the wilderness tell the story of his faithfulness. And never once did he fail, and he never. Nobody but Jesus Who pulled me out of that pit He did, he did Who paid for all of our sin Nobody but Jesus Who rescued me from that grave Yahweh, Yahweh Who gets the glory and praise Nobody but Jesus Yahweh, Yahweh, and who gets the glory and praise? Nobody but Him. This is our God. This is who He is. Oh, He loves us. And this is our God. This is what He does. He saves us. He bore the cross, beat the grave, let heaven and earth proclaim. This is our God. He's King Jesus.
thank you for your Holy Spirit in this place. I pray that you put your hand upon the rest of this service today as Pastor comes to bring your word, Father. Lord, help you help him to speak your word, speak your truth. Use him as you see fit. Father, we just thank you for your goodness. Bless this service in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Is this, there we go. Amen. Thank you for leading us into worship. What a powerful, powerful thing. Good morning. My name is Barb. I'm a volunteer here at Hope Community Church, and I'm Pastor Don's wife, and it's a privilege to be here welcoming you this morning. When you came in, you should have received a program. If you did not get a program, please raise your hand. We'd love to bring one to you. At the bottom of the program is a connection card, and we like everyone to fill one out every single week. It's on perforated paper, so you just tear it off like that. Um, just if you filled this out over and over, all I need is your name, really. And then just on the back, if, uh, if you want to tell us something, maybe you're ready to serve, maybe you have a prayer request, we would love for you to fill that out. Put it in the um, blue box on next to the door on your way out th today. If you are a first-time guest with us, I would love for you to fill out as much as you feel comfortable on this connection card and bring it back to me at the welcome table because I have a gift for you. We just want to thank you for spending your morning with us because we know there are so many things you could be doing on a Sunday morning, especially with this beautiful weather, right? Um, so we're so grateful that you chose to be here, and I'm sure um, it's it's a, a beautiful fragrance to the Lord for us to be worshiping, worshiping him together today. Um, check in on Facebook for each check-in. Hope Community Church donates a dollar, and this month we are donating our monies to E3 Family Solutions, which is a local organization equipping youth, empowering parents, and encouraging communities. Um, if you if you have been around for a while, you know that I personally have a connection with them. I work for E3 Family Solutions. I appreciate all the prayers you guys have been praying. Um, we are back into the schools. It's somewhat conditional, um, but we're, we're making baby steps into doing what we love to do, which is talking with students about avoiding risky behaviors and making healthy choices. So thank you for your prayers. Keep them coming. We love that. Uh, we are having tonight a celebration, a baptism. Carlos, who's sitting up here on our front row, is being baptized tonight. <laughs> Woo! Praise the Lord. I'm getting choked up. So we are um, doing that at the Pranger household. And so Austin and Jamie, if you're not familiar with them or where they live, please see me at the welcome table. I will give you address. I will give you um, contact information. It's at 6 p.m. So in addition to the baptism, we're having a potluck. So we want to, um, are you coordinating? Is that correct? Okay, side dishes or desserts, and if you want to come early to swim, you may do that around 5 p.m. Okay, and again, I have address and contact info at the welcome table. The ladies group will not be meeting this coming Tuesday because it's Halloween. So we're, we're not meeting formally, and we're not doing our study. But we are going to just hang out at Panera Bread if you'd like to join us. For those of you who are not participating in the Halloween activities, um, you are welcome to join us at Panera Bread at Lake Sumter Landing at 630. Um, and it, that's open to any lady, even if you haven't been attending our Bible study. We don't care. We just like to chat and eat, really. So just... <laughs> Come join us. And then the men have their turn on Saturday. So the men's breakfast is this coming Saturday at 8 a.m. here. Uh, so all men are invited to join uh, in that activity. They also like to chat and eat. Yes. <laughs> uh, reminder, you can give to the church by texting 352-444-1771, or you can put your offering in the blue box located next to the door. So we hope you find the service relevant. Thanks for joining us. Stay after for pastries and coffee. All right. Hey, I do want to thank everybody for the um, pastoral appreciation cards. That's, that's awesome. And I also want to thank you guys. Um, somebody was commenting today that all the stuff that goes on behind the scenes, and uh, I mean it's a lot. We have we have the best volunteers. Uh, we have we have awesome volunteers. 
And uh, I think yesterday we gave gave away at least 500 candy bars, uh, prob probably more. And um, and it and it's always nice to go out to our tent, and our tent is just loaded with with people that are wanting to serve and connect to the community. So um, you guys are awesome. So we're in a sermon series, and we're going to the book of First Peter. Um, and our sermon series is called Returning to Our Roots, because we want to be deeply rooted in Jesus Christ so we can go out and make a difference in the community. That's, that, that's a purpose. We're going to be rooted, and then we're going to go out and make a difference. And uh, we're going to go to uh, the beginning of First Peter chapter 4. We're going to cover the first 11 verses. And sort of like last week, I just want to tackle this a, a few passages at the time. Because Peter, and Peter, in, in going back to those roots, he likes to go deep. So, so we've got to slow it down a little bit, go deep with him. So if you have your Bibles, we're at uh, First Peter chapter 4. It's going to be on the screen. There's Bibles in the seats in front of you. Most of you have one on that uh, electronic device you have in your hand, um, and you can look at that. But if I see you going like this, I know you're playing a game and you're not uh, actually reading the Bible. So 1 Peter chapter 4, beginning at verse 1, Peter writes to the church. He says, Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh... Arm yourself with the same way of thinking. For whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, so as to live the so as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. So last week I said uh, Peter had a, a substantial amount of difficult passages to in, interpret in the previous chapter, and he's not going to let up in this chapter. So there's a few more, and it, uh, one, one starts right here. And recently, um, I've had several discussions where people say, well, how come sometimes Christians, you know, and I'll go to a different church, and they read the same Bible, but they come to a different conclusion, and sometimes a radically different conclusion? Well, it's pretty simple. They're wrong. No. Um, <laughs> okay. If, if you're a guest here, I'm, I'm kidding. Don't don't, don't leave. Um, I'm not saying sometimes people aren't wrong, and I'm not saying sometimes those people aren't me. Uh, but first, we need to recognize that certainly within Orthodox, lowercase o, Orthodox Christianity, there, there is some room uh, for disagreement and some coming to some different conclusions. Uh, Paul talks about that, Romans chapter 14. He goes through and he says, hey, some of you, you know, you think all days are the same. Some of you think this day's special. Uh, you know, there's all these food things. So there's some things going on. And he, he says, but you guys can still live in fellowship. You guys can still have fellowship. And his answer is, is the same answer that I'm going to give for um, a starting place for interpreting Scripture. Um, and it's the third word in this passage, Christ. Okay, we got to we got to be centered in Christ. We 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 got to start there. And if we're going to interpret Scripture, then I'm going to suggest we need to interpret it through the lens of Jesus. We need, need to go through and say, okay, how does Jesus see this? How did how would Jesus explain this? What does it mean in the light of Him? I mean, here's a radical idea. Let's understand the Word of God from the living Word of God. Let's, let's kind of go back and, and see it through His lens. And I, and I don't mean that in a simplistic way. I, I think we need to dig deep and, and say, okay, Jesus, what, what does this mean? Uh, Jesus had some issues with the religious leaders in His day about their interpretations of Scriptures. And He, he said this, uh, John chapter 5, 39 through 40, he said, you search the scriptures. In other words, he's like, hey, you guys are being biblical, so to speak. He says, but you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life, and it is, is they that bear witness about me, yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. In other words, like you're reading this, you're saying, hey, this is what we should do. And he says, you forgot one major point. These point to me. The scriptures point to me. 
So, so we need to come to Jesus. And you know what I've discovered? Maybe you've discovered this. First century, she has, or he has. First century Pharisees, they're not all that unique. They're, they're not that different than, than you and I. And sometimes it's, it's scary how unlike uh, or how, how like we are. Let me, let me just say this, and this is me included. All of us, intentional or not, we come with a geo, a political, an ethno, and an egocentric bias. All right, that's, that's just a reality. When, when, I, when I come to scripture, I come with my own bias. All right, and, and I should just be, be honest about that. And if I'm not intentional, my bias becomes my default lens. I, I see it through that lens. And so what Jesus does in the first century is he offers them a different lens. Th think about that. Jesus, who's fully Jewish, he's speaking to Jewish leaders, and he says, you have heard it said, and he says, but I say unto you. Okay, he's, he's offering them a different lens to interpret it through Jesus. And let me say this, this wasn't to deconstruct their faith, but it was to resurrect their faith to what it should have always been, okay? He's not deconstructing faith, he's resurrecting faith to, to what it is meant to be. And so when, when we come to scripture, because lots of times people say, well, is, is that biblical? Is, is that biblical? I can make almost anything biblical, all right? Um, I, I think things should be biblical, but let me, let me add something to that. Is it Christ-like? Is it, is it Christ-centered? And it, Because if it's, it's, it's not an either-or, by the way. It's not, we're either going to be biblical or, or we're going to be Christ-like. Because to, to, to be biblical is to be Christ-like. And, and, I, and, I, and I think we should, we, we should put that in there. So, so when we understand, because that, that's, what, that's what this series is pointing to. That, that's what the Bible is pointing to. The, the Old Testament, it's, it's a signpost, and it's pointing to Jesus. Don't miss Jesus in the scriptures, okay? Because we can, I, I could do all kinds of mental gymnastics and make a passage say whatever I want it to say. But the whole point of, of the Word of God is, is to point to Jesus and that you and I would come to Jesus, become like him, so that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. Not my words. Those are, those are from the Bible. Biblical. And, and if we don't get this, I spent like half my time up here. I'm just kidding. I, I've got like an hour or more. Um, <laughs> if we don't get Jesus, we don't get the rest. Okay. If, if, if we don't get this, Christianity does not work without Christ. There's, there's lots of religions out there. You take away the leader and it still works, okay? or it doesn't work, whatever, whatever you want to say. But Christianity does not work without Christ. And Peter says something here. He says, okay, church, you're going to go out to the world, and, and I want you to arm yourself. All right? Arm yourself with the thinking of Christ who suffered in the flesh. So, so we're to go out and, and think the way Jesus did. And you're reading through and you're like, okay, well, somehow Jesus' suffering brings meaning to our suffering. And, and, it, and it brings us life. Uh, Peter says, kind of a strange thing, maybe. He says, whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Like, what does that mean? Well, there's, there's a couple understandings of what Peter is saying it, it, one is he's saying is Jesus is bringing us a new perspective in which um, suffering, when, when we suffer for Christ or we suffer in the world, it causes us to rethink and reprioritize our lives around Jesus. So, so in other words, what they're saying is, hey, you're, gonna, you're persecuted, you're going through these trials, and, and that suffering, you know, kind of like, you know, you have a health issue, and all of a sudden you're like, huh. I probably need to rethink how I eat, how I, you know, whatever. So, so that's one, one interpretation. And, and I think we should follow that understanding anyways in the sense that it's probably biblical that we should 
rethink our lives in light of Christ. We should have a new perspective on everything. Uh, let, me give you, let me give you a second understanding. It's that Jesus gives us a new power. And this new power is along the lines where Paul's talking about in baptism, uh, Romans chapter 6, where, where he says, in Christ you, you have died, and, and, and you, then you're resurrected, you're dead to sin, you're resurrected to a new life. Um, Galatians 2, uh, 2.20, uh, I am crucified with Christ, therefore I no longer live. And then Paul says something really weird, and the life that I now live, <laughs> I, um, I live by Christ. So, so it's this, this new power where you and I, we identify with Jesus in his death, his burial, and his resurrection. We die to an old worldly way of living, and we rise new with, with Jesus. Now, sin's still present in the world. Have you, have you noticed that? Okay, Watch TV tonight. Uh, sin is still present in the world, but it does not have the same power over the believer because the believer has, has died to that and has a new power over that. So is it a new power? Is it new perspective? I say, why not both? <laughs> but both work, right? Because we, we need a new perspective on life and, and we need this power. We need the power to defeat sin. I'll let the theologians argue over the rest of that. But we have to ask ourselves, how did Jesus suffer? You know, did somebody call him names, whatever. Um, well, verse Peter 3, 18 tells us how he suffered. It says, for Christ also suffered once for sin, the righteous for the unrighteous. This is his, the best exchange, the best gift you're going to get today. <laughs> it's, he's going to say, I'm going to give you my righteousness and I'll take your sin so the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but a made but made alive in the spirit. Kind of kind of connects back, right? Suffering, and and then then living. Uh, in, in 1 Peter two twenty four, it says, and he he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin, and live to righteousness by. His wounds, you have been healed. And so, so Peter is saying, hey, because of this, he says, you're to go out and live the rest of the time in the flesh. And, and when he says in the flesh there, think, think about this body that we have until we get a resurrected body. All right. Um, he's saying the, the, the rest of the time that you have here, don't live those for human passions anymore, but for the will of God. I like that phrase, the rest of the time. I sort of do, sort of don't. The rest of the time. That phrase has more meaning all the time as we get older, doesn't it? Birthdays have a way of giving us perspective. How much time do we have? What, what, what is the, the rest of the time that I have? Let me say this. It's getting shorter. <laughs> the, the rest of my time, the rest of your time is getting shorter. James says this. He says, you don't know what tomorrow will bring. He says, what is your life for your midst? that appears for a little while and then vanishes. And, and Paul kind of uh, goes along this line. He says, he says, listen, he says, walk in wisdom towards outsiders, making the best use of the time. Might want to pause and say, what I'm doing, is this the best use of my time? And he, and he says, particularly towards outsiders. How do, how do I interact with those that do not know Jesus, that aren't a part of, of the kingdom? And so even though we don't know the number of our days, maybe a great question to answer today is, what will I do with the rest of my time? How, how am I, I going to use this, this resource, this gift that Jesus has given me? How will I live it out? And Peter's saying, you got basically two choices. You can just live like everybody else, or you can live um, for Christ. Kind of two basic options here. And, and then Peter, obviously, he says, 
you want to live for Christ. Let me, door number one, that's what you want. You go, go for that one. And then he gives us a list of things um, that you shouldn't do, followed by a list of things that you should do. Here's, here's what you shouldn't do with the rest of your time, and here's some things you should do. So uh, verse 3, uh, 1 Peter 4, he says, for time is past. All right. What am I doing the rest of the time? He's like, he's like, oh, these options that that let me give you some options that time has passed. He says, for doing what the Gentiles, that the word is ethnos, what the nations do, what everyone else is doing, what the pagans want to do. Living sensually, um, living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. With respect to this, they are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery, and they malign you. Now, now some people would say that maligning is the suffering that, that people are going through, and uh, sometimes that maligning is a lot stronger than, hey, why don't you live like us? Uh, but, but sin, tell me if you've had this, sin kind of has this way of being pretty subtle, and it comes along, and, and it starts to hypnotize us into following it, right? It's kind of like you, you're going down, and you're like, oh, what's happening here? <laughs> I've gone down a, a, a really bad uh, road here. And, and, and Peter says, hey, your time is short. The time is short. You, you don't have time for that. I, I got a little video that's, that illustrates how the believer should deal with the hypnotizing sin in their lives. Let's, let's see if it, if it works here. So I sing That's myself sin. to sleep. You know, self-hypnosis. Let me show you how it works. A trust in me. I know, I can't be bothered with that. I, I have no time for that sort of nonsense. So All right. I sing so, myself so you got it. to That's sleep. That's, that's, how you, that's how you deal with sin. Sin's going to come, it's going to hypnotize you, and just bam. I don't have time for that kind of nonsense, all right? Time, time is short. That's exactly what Peter is saying. They probably did that, that whole thing based on this passage. Now, now Paul, Paul's going to give us a similar list. I, I, I just want to make sure we get this in case we don't miss some of this. Um, Paul says in Galatians, now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissension, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies. And he's like, in case you didn't catch all that, he says, and things like these. And I warn you, listen, this, this is, I think this is very sobering. And I warn you, as I warned you before, those that do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Let me say this. If, if I just like went through those lists and you're like, man, I am so close to Jesus. I got this thing. Nothing on that list jumped out. Um, talk to me. You're preaching next week. Um, but let me, um, let me point out a word that, that I think describes all of that. It's idolatry. And an idol is anything that we put our trust in, in, in place or alongside the, the, the living and the true God. And, and idols are, are not neutral. It's not a neutral thing in my life. Sometimes we, we, we treat them like they're neutral. But, but here's what the idol is going to do. It is going to demand your time. And Peter says, you don't have a lot of that left. <laughs> It's going to demand your resources, and it's going to demand so much more. Peter says this in a uh, couple chapters earlier. He says, Beloved, he says, I urge you as sojourners and exiles. He's like, he's like hey, you're, you're to be a different people. You're to live differently, to abstain from the passage of passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. Man. That it wants something from you, okay? Sin and idols, they wage war against your soul. And here's the thing about idolatry. It's pretty sneaky. Every culture has them, and it is so much easier to see it in another culture. You, you travel somewhere, and you're like, man, look at these pagan idol worshipers. Like, like they're bowing down to that idol, 
it's a lot harder to see it in my own life. Uh, in uh, 155 AD, there was an elderly man, um, Polycarp is his name. I don't know why I didn't put him in my notes. But there's this elderly man named, named Polycarp, and some of you have done, like studied church history, you, you probably know that name. Polycarp was a disciple of John, all right? And he was arrested, and he was martyred because he would not practice the common idol uh, worship of worshiping the empire or the emperor. Um, he, he wouldn't do that. And he's, he's arrested. I think he's like 85 years old. Uh, the people come to arrest him and he makes them breakfast and prays with them. And uh, he's just like the calmest person through this whole thing. And when he's arrested, here's the question he was asked. But what harm is there in saying Caesar is Lord and offering incense and so forth to be saved? Fascinating, huh? In other words, there's, he, he's, he's not being executed because he worshiped Jesus. In some sense, that, that's fine. You, you can have Jesus. Just keep these other idols alongside. And near his final moments, uh, we are told, uh, as they're about to light him on fire, uh, they say to him, Swear by the genius of Caesar. Change your mind and say, away with the atheist. And by atheist, they mean Christians because they don't worship the gods of, of the empire. And Polycarp, 85-year-old man, he's solemn. He, he looks out towards the crowd and he waves his hand and he says, away with the atheist. And then they, then they killed him. And most of the time, our idols aren't so bold that they overtly ask us to walk away from Jesus. The idols of, of our hearts, what they do is they say, just put them on the same level. Put them on the same level as Jesus. You can say Jesus is Lord. Just make sure you say Caesar is Lord. We're, we're, we're okay with that. And I would guess... The greatest danger in this room isn't that you have a statue that you put on a shelf and, and, and you bow down and pray to it. I'm not saying that doesn't happen, but the greatest danger is I allow idols of my heart, whatever they may be, I allow them to comfortably coexist with Jesus. And, and that, 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 that is the danger. And if you want to know what, what, you know, okay, what idols are in your life, um, just ask yourself a couple questions. What is it that I give equal importance to of God? What, what is it that I trust equally to God? What is it that causes me to say no to Jesus? What, 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 what's in my heart? Maybe what's hypnotizing me? What am I spending my time, or the time that I have left, what am I spending too much time on? That may be an idol. Feel free to pray about it. Ask Jesus. He's, he's better. The Holy Spirit's so much better at searching your heart than I am. Well, let's continue. And, and Peter, he soberly continues here. He, he's reminding us of something that we're all going to face. Verse 5, he says, But they will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. Verse 6, this is why the gospel was preached even to those who are dead. That uh, though judged in the flesh the way people are, they might live in the spirit the way God does. Uh, verse 5, I, I think it's pretty, pretty straightforward. Jesus is ready to judge the living and the dead, right? All of us, through either, either death or we're alive when Jesus returns, we're going to give an account for what we did in the body. We're going to give an, an, an account for that. And I imagine at top of that list... It's going to be the question, do you have faith in Jesus Christ? You know, Jesus said, when the Son of Man returns, will he find faith on, on the earth? So I, I think at the top of that list is, did you trust Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? And were you faithful to him? Peter himself preached in Acts. He said, and there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. 
So now verse 6 is is a little more tricky here. Uh, And it brings up the same question we asked last week. Did Jesus go somewhere and preach to the dead, giving them a second opportunity to receive Christ as Savior? Let me give you the short answer. It's the same as last week. No. Uh, And and you can look up what I said last week if, if, if you weren't here. But, but it's for the same reasons that I don't think he, he went uh, somewhere and, and preached with this opportunity to receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Last week, we looked at 319, where it said he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison. Now, let, let, me, let me say, I think there's a differentiation here. In 319, it appears that Jesus is speaking to non-human spirits, and he's proclaiming his victory over sin and over death. He's, he's talking to fallen angels and, and saying, you know, he's resurrected, and he says, I won. You know, death and sin, you, you are finished. Now, the difference here is I believe these are people. And, and, and the verbiage it isn't proclaiming a victory it's proclaiming the gospel. It's, it's proclaiming good news. And I'm also going to suggest this, and we can agree to disagree. The people that are hearing the gospel that he's speaking to have previously heard the gospel. He's not, he's not going and talking to dead people and sharing the gospel. The, these are people that, that have heard the gospel um, and have, have died since then. Because there could be an argument like, oh, you follow Jesus? Where does that get you? You, you die like every other person. All right? And so the, the whole point here is, yes, you and I are going to face death. And we might even face it in the way that Polycarp did, where we're going to be judged in the flesh to the point of death. He's saying that's, that's all a reality. But Jesus' victory is not taken away, okay? The victory is not stolen. For the faithful in Jesus, we can sing, Death, where's your victory? Death, where's, where's your sting? Hey, listen, listen, death. Our resurrected king has rendered you defeated. That, 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 that's our proclamation. Nothing separates us from Jesus, all right? The, the, the principalities out there, in any of that stuff, it does not separate you from Jesus. Your victory is in Jesus. And this, this is the reason why we continue to preach. Because we know that Jesus will judge the, the living and the dead. And, and, and we know this, although we die in Christ, we will live in the Spirit the way God does. All right? The believing dead are in God's presence. They are alive in God's presence. That's what Peter is reminding them here. Uh, John, in, in John's gospel, Jesus claims this. He says, I am the resurrection. In other words, Jesus is like, it's not a concept. That's me. All right? I'm the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. All right. We're going to keep going through some tricky passages here. Verse 7, Peter says, the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. So, so Peter's making a transition here, and, and we know something, right? We, anybody here read the book of Revelation? All right. So in the, in the book of Revelation, Jesus wins. There's a new heaven. There's, there's a new earth. Now, it's the previous chapters, and every time a new war breaks out or something happens in the world, I just know it. Somebody's going to come up to me and they'll say, Pastor, are we living in the end times? Is this it? Is, is this the end? And usually I say, probably not any more than yesterday. I, I, don't, I don't know. Maybe it's the end. You know, I, I don't sell books on this stuff. Um, I do know this. Jesus said there will be wars, there will be rumors of wars, and and we've had that for a couple thousand years, and and I think what Peter would say, this isn't a time to panic, but it is a time to be sober-minded. 
We, we, need, to, we need to be sober-minded. And, and the fact is, we've been living in the end times for 2,000 years. All right? When, when Jesus was resurrected from the dead, the, when, when, when the apostle Paul finally recognized that Jesus was rected, resurrected from the dead, he's like, oh, that happens at the end of time. We're living in, we're living in the last days because the resurrection has begun. And, and, and you and I, we have a peace, we have a taste of the kingdom of God because we, we have the Holy Spirit of God within us. We, we have this foretaste of, of what things is going to be. Jesus said this, and he speaks to us today. He says, therefore, stay awake. Stay awake, church, for you do not know when the master of the house will come in the evening or at midnight or when the rooster crows or in the morning. So how, how should we live? Well, it's probably best to live as though Jesus is coming at any time. All right? It's probably best to do that. And with you and I knowing it, it it's kind of like you've been given a cheat sheet. All right? <laughs> like, like you have the cliff notes. You know how the story ends. And knowing what Jesus' kingdom is like and our task at hand that we're to go out and make disciples. You know, I, I won't argue with you if you're like, the time is definitely, you know, it's coming. All right, let's go out and love people then. Let, let's go out and share the gospel. Let, let, let's go out and make disciples. And when we do that, we need to be sober-minded. We need, we need to be self-controlled. And, and, and this sober-mindedness, it, it should direct our prayers. All right? There's this whole world out there. There's a whole world of disinformation and anxiousness. And what God is doing, he's sending the church out into that world where, you know what we should be? A calm presence. We should be a calm presence uh, pointing to the hope that we have in Jesus. I remember, I think it was two summers ago, we, we had one of our booths set up at an event, and, and it was like within the, uh, where we were set up, there were, there were two tents next to us, and they had like very opposing political ideologies. And I was just like, great. This is wonderful. I get to be here. And then Menachem, who's more spiritual than me, he's like, he comes up and he says, God has put us right where he needs us. That, 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 that we're going to be the sober-minded peacemakers in, in, in this world. And I'm like, okay, Lord, he's right. I'm, I'm, forgive me for complaining about this here. Um, but, but in this, this isn't the time to fight like the world, all right? This, this is the world. This is the time to arm ourselves in the thinking of Jesus. This is the time to live more like Jesus. This, this is the time where our light should shine. Where does the light shine the best? In the darkness, okay? Don't, don't, don't lose who you are in, in the midst of this, all right? The moment we're in hasn't changed the mission we are on. Stay on task. Now, Peter's going to conclude this section, and for your sake, I'll conclude it too. Uh, begin at verse 8. He says, above all, all right, and, and, and that doesn't mean forget everything I said, but as you do everything said, here, here's how you're going to do it. He says, above all, keep loving one another earnestly. Church, what? Keep loving one another, since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. I mean, I mean, yeah, yeah. Menachem was calling me out on my grumbling there. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Like we, we don't all have the same gifts, right? And, and he, says, he says, just take the gifts that he's given you and, and, and use them. He says, whoever speaks as one who speaks the oracles of God. That's pretty scary standing up here now. Whoever speaks as, as who speaks the oracles of God. And whoever serves 
as one who serves by the strength that God supplies in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Now, I really like this part where Peter says, um, love covers a multitude of sins. Um, Again, I'm not totally sure exactly what he means. Um, But I know that we're sent out in the world and we're not to fight like the world, but we're to love like Jesus. And certainly I can look and say, well, Jesus has covered my sins. You know, there was a check I wrote that I couldn't cash. And and Jesus says, I'm going to cover you at the cross. All right. So Jesus covers my sins at, at the cross. But what does it mean here for, for us that, that, that we're loving and that's covering a multitude of sins? My best guess is it's similar to Proverbs uh, ten twelve: Hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all offenses. And so the, the best way I could think about this, imagine like sin is a fire. And, and, that, and that fire is going, and, and what do fires like to do? Consume, right? And, and so imagine you have this blanket. Let's just call the blanket love. And you, you could do a couple things with that blanket. We could stir up that fire, right? Give that fire some oxygen. You know, there's a fight going on, and we can invite ourselves to that fight. Give, give it some fuel. Give it some oxygen. Let it, let it grow. Um, go on social media, read the comments on something controversial, and you'll understand what I'm saying. Um, or, you know what we can do? We could cover that, right? Fire's right there. I got, I got that blanket, and, and, I, and I cover that. And how do we do that? We do that through repentance. We do that for, through forgiveness. We do that through reconciliation. Love covers a multitude of... Of, of sin. Fight like the world, the fire grows. Fight like Jesus, you could possibly uh, put that out. Let me just close with this question. We all have a certain amount of time left. And none of us knows how much time we have left. But my question, and I believe what Peter's question would would be is, what are you going to do with the time that you have left? You know, and, and maybe even ask Jesus, hey, Jesus, I know that I have a limited amount of time. What should I do with the time that I have left? Let's pray. Father God, I'm so thankful for your grace and, and for your mercy. And, and even... Even death cannot have victory over us if we cling to you, Jesus. We're so thankful for that. We're so thankful for you dying for our sins and our salvation to to give us a new power and a new perspective. And Lord, I, I lift up each person here, myself included, Lord, that we would be faithful with the time that we have left. Lord, I pray that each person here today would ask you, Lord, how can I serve you? How can I serve your kingdom with the time that I have left? Lord, I I pray all these things and I ask them for your sake, for your glory, for your kingdom. And it's in Christ's mighty name I pray. Amen. stories of what they think you're like what I've heard the tender whisper of love in the dead of night cause you tell me that you're pleased and that I'm never alone you're a good good father it's who you are 
that the most profound three words that we can find in, in the Bible, in 1 John, God is love. Amen. God, we thank you today for every blessing of life. God, we thank you for being who you are. Thank you for being a, a good, good father. God, in so much more than, than we can even comprehend. Your love and your mercy for us is so much greater, God, than we can perceive. God, we ask that you just go with us today, God, as we leave this building that we would not leave from your presence, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Look forward to seeing you guys next week. Love ya.
is on your shoulders and over your head is a dark cloud when you try you try to scream and ask for help but nothing seems to come out right keep moving forward take another step keep moving forward take another step take another step don't let the fear that turns your feet to stone leave you feeling all alone your alibi up in the sky is watching with his shepherd's eye so just remember he'll provide and keep moving forward Hard to breathe, hard to